Good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located in the world. Today is January 4th for me. And we're going to continue on with emphasis in composition. I tried to get through everything yesterday, but I could not. There was just so much goodness with emphasis in composition that uh, it has taken several streams, well, at least two so far. I'm pretty sure we'll get through the rest of it today, though. And I misspelled silhouette. That is not how you spell silhouette. My spelling is, is pretty bad, so I need to look at uh, my Google document to make sure that I actually spelled it correctly. I'm an artist, not a mathematician, or an English professor, which is kind of funny. You know, what's really funny is I work with... Um, at my job, I work with individuals all over the world. <laughs> and they know multiple languages, everyone I work with. <laughs> Except for me, I struggle with spelling in English. <laughs> totally my fault. But let's get right into it. Enough of that. Uh, let's do a, a review first, actually. I'm going to go over a little bit of this. I guess what I'll do is I'll scroll through my uh, Google document on emphasis and kind of do a quick review of what we hit yesterday. Uh, the, the document and everything, all the files will be up on the Gumroad course soon. I wasn't able to, I didn't have time to put them up yesterday, but... I'll probably do two or three at once. It goes a bit faster if I can kind of batch them in that way. So, uh, and I'll let everyone know that has purchased that course that they'll be that it is updated. Okay, so yesterday, January twenty third, we went we focused on emphasis and we started with focal points. Uh, the thing to remember there is to have one main focal point, max two or three secondary focal points. We looked at Monet and camouflage with his paintings because he didn't have a lot of focal points. And then we looked at a painting by Ilya Repin, which had a great focal point. If you're creating composition and you want to draw attention, what people look at first is humans are first, animals are second, man-made structures, and then organic features after that. So look at some master art and define focal points. I think that was part of the homework from yesterday was basically to start collecting your art, which I've already asked you to do several times. It's a fun practice. In the information age, you just go online and you search for your favorite artist, and then you do some downloading of images, some screen clipping, you know? And then you look at who their influences are, and you start collecting them, and then you have a lot of fun. As you collect those images, you can look at them for... Uh, compositional elements for ideas and just kind of uh, break them apart. Learn from them. So the homework was look at some master art and define focal points. What are the focal points within there? Then we went into symbols. We looked at shape symbols like crosses and halos, stars, all kinds of different things. And then we went into color and it's the symbol of color, red and green. For America's Christmas, orange and black, Halloween, red and white, Valentine's, and then all the symbols of these colors. We, we learned that gray equals death, sickness, and sadness. If you want gray to, to do that. <laughs> Not in all cases, but this is some good things to go by. Also, one thing I'm definitely going to change. Health equals pink and sickness equals brown. Hmm. Don't think so. I'm going to remove that. Cropping. That's the next thing we went into as a tool to create focal points. We looked at um, a painting by MC Wyeth and did some awkward cropping on it and how we could use cropping to our advantage. Cropping down our image or opening up our image that we're working on. And that's why thumbnailing is so important so that we can really look at those images and figure out, you know, any problems with cropping and aspects like that. So color was the next one. I used an image from Fragonard, 
to show emphasis and color. Do you remember that image? That image was of a woman in a just crazy pink dress all in the green background to show emphasis. Anything that is very different will create a focal point. Uh, there's an image by Hurry or Juan that we looked at. And I can remove this. That didn't pertain to what we looked at. So if we can change the colors, the figure will pop out uh, first regardless. High contrast between the face and the background is also an aspect of color, high contrast. And then we looked at leading lines and that's what we ended with. So it's often referred to with straight lines. Think about uh, like you're at a train station. We got straight lines all over the place. And the if the lines lead off the page or close to the edge of your canvas or whatever you're working on, it doesn't work. We have to lead them to something. And the combination of objects, we looked at that actually a couple live streams ago. Uh, with a bunch of heads put together, make some lines. We saw, uh, that was not yesterday, but day before yesterday. So that would be January 1st, New Year's Day. And we looked at uh, Rockwell painting. Uh, of all things. Yeah, Rockwell's amazing. All right. And then today we're going to start with value and silhouette. So let's get right into it. This is the most important. I'm going to put a star next to it and we'll make that star yellow because we're in digital realm and we can do all that. Yay. See here, I'm using a symbol, a star. It means good job for us in a lot of ways. It means the star is in the sky, ugly star. And if you get an ugly star drawn by Chris in a digital format, it's even better. <laughs> Look at that star, it's terrible. I'm gonna leave it there <laughs> as a reminder that I could draw stars better. So this is the most important. Why is it the most important? Well, silhouettes are exactly what we work up when we do thumbnails. And the one thing that I wanted to have up here and then I'm going to include within the show notes and the downloads is a link to the collections that I've created on ArtStation. I love ArtStation because you can see a lot of these compositional principles put into practice every day for real world movies and um, games and art that create some kind of narrative. Almost everything you see on ArtStation is going for a game or a movie or something that needs to tell a story. So they're really focused on that storytelling aspect and composition does that. So I'm going to leave a link to my collection that I'll continue to grow on ArtStation of all these thumbnails. And this is why silhouette and value is so important because if you can get the simple statement. There you go. Here's some wonderful simple statements. It's just black and white. There's a little bit of gray in here. These are fantastic. If you can get everything within this simple statement, you're done. You've told your story. You've outlined the major actors, the major elements throughout the entire composition. The rest of it from here is just making it look pretty, really adding color, adding detail, but this structure is the most important. Yeah. So I'll make sure to leave a link to that within the downloads, within the course download on my gum road. Definitely. Another thing to remember is silhouette is not just black and white. So not just B and W. So most of the time when we look at silhouette, we have our picture plane and then we have a person or something within that picture plane. And it's dark in the foreground and light in the background. I can even change this to white. 
and fill it in like that. So that is black and white, and we could just really leave it as gray too. It looks better anyways. So that's a silhouette. Okay, that's one. Oops. And then, actually, you know what I'll do is I will use the power. Hey, good morning, my friend Thinker. Always showing up every day. Definitely a friend. Let's use the power of digital here to duplicate. And duplicate. And duplicate again. So, because silhouette is more than just uh, black on white, okay? It's, and I'm gonna get some examples ready here. So I can work from, because there's a bunch of different ways to silhouette something. So, what if, oops, that's one thing I always do. I go to another program, then I hit a button on, on here thinking I'm inside of Krita, and then it changes something on the other program. <laughs> it doesn't work well. So black on white is one, but what if, uh, let's say, let's work on the second one here. Instead of it just all being black, we had some value within here. Maybe this robed individual is getting hit by a little bit of light, maybe even some, you know, some highlights within there. Maybe they have a dagger or something, right? You don't know what they, what's going on there, but that's still a silhouette. We still have this, this outline. There's difference within value in there. It doesn't have to be full black and white, but that is still silhouette. But everything behind is it's got this kind of contrast to it, definitely. And then the next one, what we can do, Control R, I can select this whole area and then fill it with a black. This is silhouette as well. And then I could work into it. I could say, okay, that's really dark, but let's throw in a little indication of a person there. Still a silhouette because most of the background is white. Actually, I, I, sh I probably should have brought the, the background up to the middle or something like that, but that's still considered a silhouette. You, you're silhouetting that person, right? Or whatever that is. And then <clears throat> let's switch it completely. Let's go to this one, and I'm going to fill the whole thing with a black color. And then I'm going to pull out the gray of the foreground. And here's our person. That's also silhouette. So what is not silhouette then? If all that is silhouette, what is not silhouette. All right, let's do this one because this is the hardest one to deal with and why silhouette is so important. <laughs> what is not silhouette is when, let's see if I can get this right. You have the person right here. And Maybe you have some things going on in the background. I don't know what's back there. Just making up stuff now. All kinds of things. This is not silhouette. It's one of the hardest things that you can do, that you can make yourself do, is deal with this kind of composition where the person, the your main focal point, has the same kind of value contrast as the background. <clears throat> There's hardly any thing different. Maybe it'll get a little bit darker in the person here. You got some outlines. 
But for the most part, you're kind of in that camouflage phase. You're like, what's going on? Well, I don't know what's going on with that drawing, but I do know that if it was a good drawing, that that would not be a good silhouette. Not in a good use of value. The others stand out a lot more. If I, if I hold control and spacebar and zoom way out, you can really see which ones stand out more than others. And that last one is definitely not standing out. So let's zoom back in with by hitting number one. There we go. So silhouette is not just black and white. Oh, now I have to find my notes again. There they are. We've looked at uh, several pieces within our last, within the last live stream. And I'll go to some of those. I'm going to go back to the other file from the last live stream. Because I was, I, I was thinking I was going to get every through everything there. And we can pick out a lot of silhouettes here. So we were looking at focal points. And if you look at this person within the Ilya Repin um, painting, he is silhouetted. So there's a silhouette there. There's also a silhouette with, with this uh, person, the darker person as well. Now that's wearing a lot of dark colors. I could uh, move down and see that there's a silhouette here with N.C. Wyeth in The Last of the Mohicans. Uh, this person is silhouetted. The other people are silhouetted. There's a lot of silhouette going on in here. Especially this uh, image by Hurry Erwan. We got light on a dark background. We have this horse, this... Uh, rider on a horse here that's also silhouetted. Silhouetted silhouettes are used a lot within Art Station. They're used so much that I just took a screenshot of a lot of images that I pulled down from Art Station to not to illustrate two points. How much silhouette is used to tell a clear story that a lot of the professional artists today use, but also to illustrate the 33 and 3 rule. So as you look at this grouping of images, and this is a good practice to do for yourself when you collect a bunch of images, whether you're on Mac or Windows, uh, what you can do is just bring them up in these kind of thumbnail view, you, you have a tremendous amount of art all thumbnailed for you. And you can stand back from your screen or zoom out. I probably won't zoom out very much more because I think your screen may be smaller. And you can look at the silhouettes. You can find the silhouettes. And this is the 33 and 3 rule. So if it could read, quote unquote, read, if you could tell the story, tell what's going on from three feet away or 33 feet away, it's working as a composition. What stands out most to me are these images by Reza Afshar. I, I collected a lot of this, this person's work, Reza Afshar. And these just clear silhouettes here of what's going on. Look at this one. And I mean, this is probably a perfect example right there. We'll refer back to this again within a couple other things that we're going to be looking at, especially framing. So when you look at this sheet, all these images, which ones are not working? Which ones are not telling a, a, a clear story at 33 feet away? There's a few that get muddled for me. The first one that's getting muddled is this one here. I actually pulled out this image, Shin Jong Hun. I was using on this image, or as I was using this image, I was actually uh, painting from this image digitally to kind of uh, learn from this image. But I really should have looked at it uh, kind of far back. 
to see, you know, that the composition really doesn't work. I would say a lot of these, most of these work well. There's a couple of them that, you know, when I'm looking at them, like, I can't really tell what's going on there. I can see maybe, yeah, it's kind of a landscape, but I, I can't see what's going on with the person or if there is a person in there. But a lot of these you can kind of tell right away. And that's really important. That This is why silhouette and value is so important. So let's look at the antithesis of this. And th these images are exactly opposite of what we're talking about. This is camouflage, okay? And uh, remember the image that we looked at, we were looking at focal points. So let's scroll all the way back up here. We were looking at co this Claude Monet image yesterday and we got this camouflage. There's no real focal point, but then compared to Ilya Repin, we got focal points. But whenever there is a rule in art, remember that it can be broken to some great um, results. So I'm gonna put that down. Rules can be broken to make great art. And I'm gonna call this great because she, Bev Doolittle, really used the camouflage idea, the idea of really pushing the focal point away um, to not focus on silhouette, not focus on value, and really go against it completely. And she did it in a way where, you know, when you go into a landscape, especially with these aspen trees and this snowy kind of landscape, you see um, all the camouflage that happens within animals. And it's really fantastic. I mean, it's, I mean, it's fascinating to look at. It's fascinating to see, right? But what's even more interesting about it in my mind is, is you can look at her pieces and you say, okay, I know there's a bunch of things in there that I need to search for. So you're kind of like finding uh, images. It's, it's interactive in some way. So she did it to a great degree. And what I really like about the second one here is there is a focal point. This fox that's right in the center. There's a focal point that she's established. And then you go, okay, it's a fox and a bunch of, oh my gosh, there's, there's other people in these trees. That's amazing. So there's, it's all about discovery here. So fantastic. So anytime, anytime we go into these principles, which I call them, they're not rules. I specifically stay away from the rules name because they're not rules, they're principles. Um, know that you can break them as long as how you break them fits with the narrative and the what, which I say all the time, the story. I'm going to probably write that on every single sheet <laughs> that I create. So yeah, uh, break all these rules that you want, change them up, ignore them as long as it's good for the story. I need a lot of tea this morning. Loving my tea. A little bit of caffeine. It's wonderful. Okay, I think that's everything for value and silhouette that I need to cover. Let's get into framing. And I will be jumping into the um, the images that I've collected from ArtStation and maybe even images that I've collected uh, from master artists as well. So you can probably guess this right away, um, what framing is, because it's used like crazy within professional digital artists and ArtStation. Um, just... And I use ArtStation so much because it's really great examples of telling stories and it's contemporary. There's a tendency for artists today to always look back, look back, back, back in history. And, you know, I did that for years and your art tends to um, 
you tend to make art from that time period. When you're living in, you know, the 21st century, and you have to make art for this time period, uh, you could model your art from them, but tell a story from today. That would be good. Look at Kehinde Wiley for that. I have to show him at some point. So framing. Basically, you emphasize the focal point by de-emphasizing the edges. Oh, this is going to be a fun word. De-emphasizing edges. So de-emphasizing the edges of your composition. Uh, and these could be dark, like you see here. So dark or blurry. And we'll look at edges again. Actually, no, you know what? I screwed up. <laughs> I was talking about the wrong thing. This actually goes down here. I got ahead of myself. Let's back it up. I must have not got the great sleep last night. Okay. You're still simplifying edges with framing. That's why it's got, I got mixed up on this. So simplifying the edges of the painting and push the viewer's eye back into the focal point. That's what we're doing. And you can illustrate this really simply. Uh, I just, you, you cr create a box like this and then any kind of thing in the center, no matter what, that's the light area or the dark area, and the outside is the dark area or the light area. You can switch them, but it's the framing. Usually it's dark on the outside, and we see this all the time within uh, any pieces, tons of pieces of art within Art Station. Let's look, just look through what I've collected here. And uh, here's framing right here. It's really interesting framing because it's just kind of half, right? Uh, I've already pulled this piece down. It's really easy to see the framing there. Here's a framed piece. And I'm keeping these small for a reason. Let me pull them up just a little bit because your screen is probably smaller. So you can see a bit better. So this piece has got framing to it. And just look at the values. Don't think about what's going on within that. Just the values. We have framing here, but it's a combination. We have a dark line underneath and these light lines above and everything's framed for the center. We have uh, some amazing framing going on here and here, here. This is framed. This is a, actually a fantastic frame. I'm gonna open this one up. Look at this tree. I mean, you can't circle the composition even more than that. You know, it's like you're in a presentation and you're pointing out what you're looking at, like I do all the time. I circle it. They did this within the composition. Yes, you can do this. It's fantastic. It's a wonderful way to tell a story. This is framed. Let's look at this one a bit larger. You know, this kind of vignetting that happens. It's darker on the outsides, but we keep the viewer in the center. I mean, it's everywhere. Let's look at some of my collected work from Master Artists. Let's see if we can find any framing here, because this collection is all over the place. And I'm going to keep zoomed out to see if I can find some great examples of framing. I see a lot of examples of silhouette. And the first, you know, artists that I pick out are Wyeth. So this is an Andrew Wyeth here. It stands out really well with that sil silhouette and value. You know, what really pulls itself away, you know, uh, what really stands out. Here's a silhouette from Bierstadt. You know, he on either side and the bottom. And we, we stay in the center here. That's a nice silhouette. A nice framing, at least, sorry. And here's a great silhouette. We picked this one out before and looked at this one on a previous live stream. I mean, that one stands out above all else. But there's a lot of art here that 
you know, when it's zoomed out this far, you can't really tell what's going on. Not a lot of framing, honestly. Master artists still not using this. And they still are doing some amazing work. I say what you'll see when you see these composition elements used the most. Oh, this is wonderful. This is a photograph by Fan Ho. Look at the framing used here. Beautiful. Beautiful photograph. I love this one too. Silhouette, framing. If you outline this in very simple black and white um, and made a thumbnail of it, you would have just this fantastic composition. Look at these leading lines. These two individuals are looking at each other. This eye contact is a leading line. It's fantastic. Yeah. So not so much within the older masters here, at least the ones I've collected. You'll see it a lot in illustrations and illustrators. Everything in ArtStation is using this a lot. But how can you, I mean, the purpose of this, the purpose of framing is keeping the viewer into your focal point. Oh, the thinker asks the question, can framing be done using white or light as the outside of the frame? Oh yes, definitely. Let's see if we can find some examples of that. I'm gonna go straight to my art station folder, honestly. And I know we can probably find some. So this would be light on the outside and then a dark inside. And honestly, <clears throat> mostly what you'll see is something like silhouette, like we've talked about, where the focal point is silhouetted, then everything around is of lighter value. Here's something similar. So you got, uh, on the left-hand side of this one, you have framing done with dark, and then the individual, the one of the actors here, is part of that. And then on the right, you have the framing is done with a light color to frame this kind of tower. Interesting kind of play on different values here, which is really nice. Here you go. This is actually a nice frame and leading lines and silhouette. So everything is white. And then we have uh, the center of interest right, right in the center. Norman Rockwell did uh, several pieces. And this is gonna be maybe a bit time consuming, but there's a particular image that I'm looking for done by uh, Norman Rockwell. And I'm on my other screen looking at Norman Rockwell. Let me, let me bring this over to you. So you can, I just did a Google search for Norman Rockwell and um, master of composition here. This is uh, a wonderful piece um, telling a great story of a really difficult time in America right there, but it also has light framing with a dark subject. There's one particular one. Actually, most of his illustrations you'll see for the Saturday Evening Post is white background and the silhouette of what's going on in the center. And some of them, like this one here, he's drawn a circle, <laughs> basically around. You know, as simple as you can get there. It's just 
actually drawn a circle. Here's another one. White, dark in the center. Uh, Norman Rockwell is a great example of this. I uh, probably won't see the one. It's a it's a bunch of kids arguing, and it's a, just a wonderful composition. Man, but all of these are fantastic. I tried to get uh, several of his books once. He doesn't have many that they've produced, but they're all really expensive. Just getting some, you know, really good quality images of his art is very difficult, even digitally. I need to really put some time and effort in that and collect some Rockwell. Here's, uh, this is really famous. It looks like someone repainted it. That's definitely not Rockwell. <laughs> uh, the Thanksgiving piece. There are a lot of leading lines there with all the heads. Here's a perfect example of leading lines. Look at that. These lines of heads. Here's a wonderful example of framing. Light subjects. Darker background. Yeah, I'm not seeing it, unfortunately. The one that I'm thinking about. Great storyteller. Could tell so much in just one image, Norman Rockwell. So great to look at. Thank you for the question, Thinker. I appreciate that. All right, so that's framing. Now we have one last thing. Uh, this stream may be a bit um, shorter today, but that's okay. I have so much stuff going on. Oh, we're in 37 minutes. I'm really taking my time today. It's nice having not a lot to talk about that I, I mean, not so much to get to that I'm not rushing. Uh, I feel good about it. Not sure if you do, but <laughs> it's all about me, isn't it, right? I'm kidding. Um, maybe I can move this down. Okay, let's talk about edges. This is a lot of fun. I love edges in painting. And I'm gonna, there's a couple pieces here and oh man, I have to get the name of the this artist. Let me go back into my folder for yesterday. Fedor Vasilevich Shapev. Oh wow, that's a definitely a Russian name. Let me, let me blow this up so you can see the name. F-E-D-O-R Vasilevich Shepev. So I believe that's Russian. But a great example, I pulled this from the fo my folder of collected imagery. And edges, uh, we kind of hit, hit on it really quickly. Uh, so we emphasize the focal point using edges and by and de-emphasizing other areas with blurry edges or even just blurring them out completely. Um, you see this done really well within photographs when, pe when they use a very low aperture, a fast aperture. I'm not sure how, how they say it within photography, uh, but it creates this kind of depth of field. Depth of field. So what you'll have, and and I I mean these two images ex, uh, illustrated well. But what you'll have is let's say this is your picture plane, and the great thing about um, digital is that you can show this really well, and you have a bunch of stuff in the background, all this stuff in the background, okay, and then within digital oh that doesn't do a blur that kind of smudges everything let's do this shift r no control r i'm going to cut this out control x control v and i'm going to put it on a different layer el morris elvismore Christopher, it's Shepev. Shepev. Welcome. 
Thank you for showing up. I see. I see some. Um, I don't. I'm not sure what that says afterwards in the in the braces, but <laughs> definitely some different language there that I don't know. Welcome. Thank you for showing us that. That's awesome. I, I really enjoy other languages and, and people all over the world showing up. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so I got this on a different layer, and then I'm going to right click on this layer, and I'm going to choose add. Uh, filter mask, I believe. Yeah, filter mask. And then I can go into here and I can choose blur, Gaussian blur. Okay. And that can just blur this out. And I could probably even go into adjust. Oh, no, I have to. I have to commit that. Okay, so let's let's blur it out. Let's let's get it really blurry. So we did a Gaussian blur on it. What's great about these masks is you can turn them on and off anytime. So they they're not destructive. I can right click on here and go add another filter mask, and let's adjust the HSV so it's a bit lighter. Not that light. And hit OK. So we have this. And then what I can do is jump back to another layer or go to a layer above it and finally illustrate what I'm talking about. So this is a very blurry background. And then you draw your figure right on top. Very simple figure, not much to it. But the emphasis is caused by the sharpness of edges on the individual that you're focused within and the blurry of edges. It's almost like uh, this. there's a person and we're looking at the back of them and they're looking at a painting by, um, oh, what's his name? Pollock, Jackson Pollock. So this person is looking at a painting by Jackson Pollock. <laughs> so there you go. So that's, that is a way to use edges. And that's how I used it in my painting to the right here. So there is this really crazy background um, within this image. And it was a photograph that I got off of Unsplash and I just really wanted to paint it. And the background was of the same detail, the same sharpness as the foreground, as the person. So I very carefully, after filling in all of these blocks and areas with the wet oil paint, all these edges, I very carefully went in and I fuzzed out the edges um, on all the ba background. And if you go to my website, uh, and maybe I can do that now. Yeah, let's do that now. I like showing off a bit. Just a bit. I don't show off enough. I, I actually, I kind of never show off my artwork. Like it's there. I feel like it's um, like a no-no to show off sometimes. But if you go to my my website and go to paintings, you can see because um, I, I track my art daily, every single day. And I write about it and I think about it. And if I go into a painting, you can scroll down and you can see um, the beginning to the end of this painting. How I drew it, how I worked it up, how I started in this kind of gray format. And then what I want to get to is a spot where you can see where I'm working up the background, you see, I, like I started this kind of grisaille, and then I'm working up color over top of it. But there's a part in the in the background. Here it is. So we have this image here. Let me see if I can zoom in. Oops. 
Yeah, right here. So the image below it, the background edges are really sharp. And so I, I, I put in the head here and then I started working on the background and I started, I blurred it all out. You could see how the head just really pops out there. It's very, it's looking at it on this screen here, it's pretty subtle, but in the painting itself, it was kind of a revelation of space. So, and you, you could tell I, I finished the background. It looks amazing. I was really happy that day. So another way to do it. Oh, El Morris Elvismore has made his, had some comments. Christopher, sometimes when doing portraits, I use blur to get the shapes right, not to focus on detail. What do you think? Should you train your eyes to do it or cheating sometimes with blur will help? Cheating sometimes with blur. There is no cheating in art, El Morris. That's the first thing I'm gonna say, there's no cheating. Um, the only time that I would say no that's bad is when you copy something from another artist or you use AI art right now and you say, this is my own, I created it all myself and it looks like someone else's. Like, uh, that is not cheating, that's just really hurting you as a person. So try and get away from that word of cheating, okay? There are professional artists out there that cheat for a living. Look at uh, Chihuly, he's a glass blower and he hasn't touched a piece of glass in decades, but he has created tens of thousands of works since then. How does that happen? He has a team of people that does it for him. Look at the workshop of Rembrandt, or even better would be, um, oh, what's his name? Rubens, the very old painter Rubens. He directed a team of artists. I mean, would you call that cheating? I wouldn't, because he's a master artist <laughs> and all of his paintings are priceless. So this whole idea of cheating has kind of gone out with the wind. It's like saying that digital is cheating to make a movie. No, you gotta make it with maquettes and all this other kind of stuff, or using digital to help you out, or using grids to help your drawing. No, it's not cheating. I would say it's stepping stones to improve your skill in a lot of ways. But let's let's focus on your question. So you blur the shapes to get to like not focus on the detail. I've done that so many times in my traditional paintings and in the digital paintings as well, where you're working up something and you got caught into all the details. And then all of a sudden, let me see if I can grab this. Where's that image at? It's down here somewhere. And then all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I have no idea what's going on. So let me blur it all out. And let's get, let me get a bigger brush here. I don't really like how this blur is working. Let's not do it that way. Let's do the Gaussian blur. Right click, add, filter mask. Under blur, we got Gaussian blur. And so you blur everything out. Let's go crazy blurred right? This is a wonderful way to get away from your piece, especially when you're up close and to see if the basic shapes, those really big shapes work. You're getting back to that thumbnail stage in a different way. Okay. And this is fantastic. A, a great thing to use. Use it traditionally, traditionally, use it digitally. If it helps you tell your story better, it's not cheating. It's fantastic. And then Elmore says, no, I meant in terms of bad habits. Oh, <laughs> like you're cheating yourself. Yeah, no, I don't think uh, the only, you know, I, I have a, a few um, a tutorials coming up. And as you can see with, you know, all my paintings, I still grid out the, uh, the canvas before I do the drawing. But what I've done and, and this is what I would call maybe somewhat of a bad habit uh, that I have that I, I would like to get away from. But let's talk about habits real quick. And, and this uh, pertains to it. If, 
let's say you're trying to change the way you eat. You're trying to lose some weight, okay? For the last 20, 30 years, or however old you are, you've eaten a certain way. And you're like, you know what? I really need to cut out all this bread and these chips and the pizza. Oh, pizza is so good, right? So, or, or maybe you're quitting smoking or something like that. Something that's very difficult to quit. You wouldn't go cold turkey. For some people that would work, a very small percentage of people that would work. You wouldn't say, I'm never going to eat X again. Or tomorrow I'm going to change from two, from 3,000 calories a day to 500. And no, you would fail right away. Okay. Because you went from where you are now. So now, actually, let's move this down here at the bottom. So here you are right here. Okay. This is your little stick figure. And this is a timeline. And this is you in the future where you want to be. And this could be anything. This could be skill. This could be weight. This could be health. This could be everything. And over here, you're the king. Okay. You're awesome. This is where you want to be. But there's this timeline of getting there. And if you look at magazines, if you look at other artists, if you look at what's out there, they always want to tell you to do this, boom, to make this really big leap all the way to the end. And that just can't happen. You can't lose all that weight within the time that they, you know, say that they can get you to do that or quit smoking within that time, right? You can't be pro artist. Let's let's focus on art. So pro artist tomorrow, next week, next year, five years, right? I've been working on this for 10 years straight, every single day. Today, and I'll show you my protocol. Today is day 3,631. I'm almost to 10 years. And I, I still don't think I'm a professional artist. Well, I do it professionally. I mean, I focus on it, but I still have a ton to learn. 10 years. And I feel like I'm still kind of right here, okay? Maybe... Um, someone else would feel like they're, they're way far ahead, like maybe they're, they're up there, but it's all subjective in that aspect. But we take these little steps, okay? And this is where we get to next. And this is our stretch goal right here. We're stretching ourselves by that 1%. And then maybe next week, we get another 4% better. And then the week after that, we improve another 1%. <clears throat> every day maybe within here we're hitting one percent one percent one percent but you get in those little steps and you're like chris why are you talking about habits because one of the the foundations for being a great artist is habits just like for being a great athlete for being a great anything is your habits and so i grid so when i do a grid on my painting Right now, after a lot of time, it's a pretty large grid. So you maybe have started out a grid. And I know you're not talking about grids, but this is a good example. Maybe you've started out gridding your painting, okay? And it's these little tiny grids. Maybe it's uh, one inch by one inch, right? All over the canvas. And so this is your level one. If you're playing a video game, level one, one by one inch grids. And so you use that and you say, oh, okay, I'm learning how to draw this face, this, this particular detail I'm learning from it. And then a week later you go to level two. So instead of it being one inch by one inch, you maybe have uh, two inch by two inch grids, right? So this is level two. And that could take a week, it could take a month, it could take a year. But then eventually, 
eventually as you're going down this line and you're getting better every day you're trying to get away from you know these habits that are stunting your growth as an artist eventually what you get to is you start a painting oops shift b you start a painting like this a vertical and horizontal that's it and your subject matter has the same grid and then when you're all the way down the line you're like i don't need those anymore i'm totally cool i can i can reproduce what i see perfectly so there's no bad habits there's habits that you want to get better at and however you start to move away from that however you start to get that first one percent better to stretch yourself that's how you can do so if you're thinking that um, fuzzing things out is kind of a bad habit how can you break that down so that you can do it a little bit less a little bit less a little bit less how can you get better a little bit at a time so you don't need it eventually that's what is best to focus on yeah and now I'm going to get back to uh, Thinker's question. How are lost edges used? Which is really good. That's a great question. And we're going to look at this piece here. I don't think there's many lost edges here. But the one thing that I will point out, because this is an oil painting, and you will see that the background itself is very fuzzed out. Not like in a, photo a photography way, because I don't think photographs existed at this point. I'm not sure. But in kind of a softness of all these edges, just kind of softened them out with the brush strokes. You know, still the same kind of aspect. But everything else, the silhouette for this person is sharp, sharp, sharp. And we focus within there. So that's... Yeah, and you, uh, thank you, El Morris. This is a good question. You had a wonderful question, too. I love talking about the foundational aspects of habits and things like that to help artists. Because at the end of the day, and I could talk about this way too much, at the end of the day, if um, no matter how good you are, if you can't get to the easel every day and actually put the work in because you're unmotivated, it doesn't really matter. Take the best artists on the planet, but if they're not painting every day they're not creating they're not doing anything um so lost edges though lost edges uh that's a really good question lost edges in a lot of ways and uh see the the trouble here is i don't think i have any images up let's let's use google for this yeah let's use google I'm going to do lost edges and oil painting. A lot of the times when you use lost edges, oh, Richard Schmidt, that's right. Richard Schmidt is, is like the best for, for lost edges. R-I-C-H-A-R-D-S-C-H-M-I-D, Richard Schmidt. He just died a few years ago. Uh, talk about a modern master. It was very sad to see him go. Um, but he uses lost edges all the time. I mean, in every one of his pieces, let's look at the art gallery. Let's go to, let's go to figures. And, oh wow, these are like more drawings than anything. Let's go to this one. Oh, can we see it bigger? Yes, thank you. So if you look at his work, um, there's just lost edges everywhere. And it's almost like everything is really hard because we're talking about edges in a lot, in a lot of ways. Oh, her right arm, is that a lost edge? Uh, not really, I would say. Well, yeah, I guess so. Like the difference between... Um, her coat, like her chest and the arm, like there's no edge there. It just kind of all blends in together. 
Yeah, that's definitely a lost edge. You, we can barely tell that there's a separation there. A lot of times, I wanted to focus a little bit on edges, lost edges um, within foreground and background. And I can't blow this up any, any larger than it is, unfortunately. Um, a lot of times when you get lost edges between the foreground and background, it will create this greater sense of depth within the piece. But within Richard Schmidt, at least this piece here, you'll see that everything is almost sharp edges, almost everywhere. But because he uses, you know, a lot of lost edges in the background, it really does that blur so that you focus on maybe the, the foreground, these two pieces, two women. Let's look at uh, just Richard Shajan art on Google. Look at images. I'll be able to see a lot more. This one here is fantastic. There's a lot of lost edges there. And of course, it's not going to come up. There it is. All of these lost edges within the clothing and everything. I mean, you can't tell what the heck's going on in anything else except for the hands, the book, and the head. I know that this person is laying somewhere and reading a book. And it looks like one of Richard Schmidt's book. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Let's look at something... I, w I would say for the most part, lost edges de-emphasize things. Lost edges group things. It's a good way to get implied lines with a grouping of, of items. Like this, this one right here I'm looking at. These rocks that are here, they're all kind of the same value. And instead of having all these separate rocks, remember we talked about small, medium, huge? We have all these small rocks that are grouped together in one medium thing with a bunch of lost edges, which is fantastic. Lost edges uh, where it can be done within value, within color. So you can have a lot of soft edges or hard edges right next to each other, but because they're the same value, they look like they're you know, so close together, they're almost lost, you know, very similar value. So we have all these trees in the background, so a lot of lost edges there. And we keep the focal point, sharp edges. Richard Schmidt is, is absolutely fantastic. I could look at his art all day. Just, um, if you want to see a master of brushwork, um, you know, a, a more contemporary master of brushwork, rather than John Singer Sargent, look at Richard Schmidt. Talk about a lot of motivation and influence right here. Schmid. I got his book. He's got a wonderful book called A La Prima. And tons of practical wisdom within that. Okay, so did I cover everything within edges? Yeah. That's everything. How long did we go? It was going to be a short stream and here we are at an hour. <laughs> I can't help but enjoy talking about art all the time. Think or how many times have I said that? I've said, oh, it's gonna be a short stream and then I go an hour. So there we are. We have worked with silhouette and value being the most important because this is where all your thumbnails come from. This is the planning of your entire composition. This is the planning of your entire story. Get that right and everything else is good. Remember that you can break the rules as long as it meets your story, as long as it tells the better story. We looked at framing, very simple. Light to dark, dark to light. Uh, you put more emphasis on your subject by doing a vignette around the subject, either dark or light. Look at Norman Rockwell and write his name down. Good example of light background, dark focal point. 
thanks for that question. It led me to Norman Rockwell. It's fantastic. Yeah, you've lost count on how many times I said it would be short. <laughs> oh, can I look at Fritz Thallow? If I know Fritz, is this, isn't he the guy that does a lot of the water paintings? I may have seen him. Let's look at Fritz. Yeah, I was right. Oh, man, my brain. I tell you what, I can't remember a lot of things like how to spell or math or whatever, but I can remember art, let me tell you. Man, I, I looked at Fritz Thalo, and if you want to learn how to paint frickin' water, I mean, this is this is at a time, I, I, I can't remember when he was alive. I haven't really looked at his history. Maybe he did have photographs. I don't know. They were black and white at the time. But uh, the guy studied water and loved water water love reflections in water look how authentic this water looks i don't care about anything else actually he didn't either look at these compositions what's the focal point in this one this is fairly uh camouflage the water itself is what we're focusing on here and just the beauty of of how it's been done here's some clarity the, the focal point, I mean, he's fuzzed out the buildings in the background. The focal point is the water. That's what he's loved. That's what he loved doing. Wonderful example. Thank you for bringing this up. Fitz Thalow. T-H-A-U-L-O-W. Now we have a pretty clear, well, somewhat clear focal point here, the person on the raft, but... I love the overall composition here, this, this like, stripe through the composition. Although you're, you, he leads the person right off the edge of the campus. It would be better to have some kind of blocker there to keep someone inside. Oh, is this Fritz Thalo? Oh, that's a fantastic composition. Look at this. I mean, right in the center, we're looking at this is... You know, it's super clear of what we're looking at here. And he's uh, got his love, which is the waves and the water in there. We have the silhouette, but not overall the whole thing. He's silhouetted the... I'm going to blow this one up. Can I... Hopefully I don't go to a website. Okay, this is great. Um, yeah, go away. There you go. So this is fantastic. There, there's several um, compositional elements that are happening here that are really pointing out this focal point like a beacon. The number one is a silhouette. So this is a dark boat and he put just this light reflection behind it. So it's, it's the sharpest um, edges in the painting are all right here. And it's based on light and dark. So the dark is dark and light is lights are all right there just about. What's well, darker over here? You could probably have softened out a lot of those edges over here to to improve this, but uh, it's fantastic. The other thing is is he broke a plane. So you have a very definite line of the uh, horizon line and whenever you break that, whenever you send something above it and below it, it's almost like a crosshairs for humans. We look right at it. So fantastic. And then there is some um, framing going on. He's framed out everything with dark around it, except at the top right. But the framing happens just, just as fine with these very subtle value changes in the clouds. But a nice frame around the whole thing. And then look at the leading lines. Uh, hopefully you can see the leading lines here. Let's do this. I'm going to, on Windows, uh, Windows key shift S, and I can take a screenshot of this really quickly, and then just paste it into wherever I'm at within a credit document. Oh, where'd it go? Got to zoom out. Oh, there it is. It's this huge thing here. Let's increase our canvas size. Can we remember what that is? Control Alt C. Yes. Let's go down another thousand. 
and then change our anchor. There we go. And then I can move Fritz Thalo and his awesome composition here. Okay. Thank you for bringing this artist up. So leading lines, we got a bunch of them, a bunch of really cool leading lines here that point directly to what we're looking at. This one goes a little bit off, so it's like in there, but it's trying, it's trying. This one points there. We have this line that's, you know, kind of leading everything in. We have the horizon line, which, you know, that will always lead someone into where th those lines are broken. We could have, we could call this a leading line where it's the, this kind of connection, or maybe the clouds have a connection. But there's, there's this pointing, so there's a darker space in those clouds that happens here. And don't think that this is um, happenstance. All great artists, uh, they look at these things and they go, okay, this, this is where I want. Look at this subtle line here of the wave. Yeah, he's telling a story. And it's all about this little boat right in the center. And everything's pointing to it. Just fantastic. So I'm going to write that down. Leading lines. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you. Thanks for being here. If you're interested in downloading or if you're listening to this and you haven't already, you can go to my Gumroad, uh, which is linked in the description of this live, live stream, and you can grab all of the downloads, all of the resources for this live stream for only $10. And if you're part of this live stream, if you're here right now, you can use CB50 off and get 50% off the $10. And it will be only $5 for everything that I do here. It's growing. We're up to number nine now, nine days in a row. And I have so much compositional stuff to get through as well that I could see this going for 30 days or more. Those files are going to be huge. So for 5 or $10, you're getting a growing uh, list of awesome course material. And I have a bunch of other things coming up. So keep showing up here. These live streams will always be free. But if you want the downloads, if you want to get into a little bit more of what I've done, uh, the PDFs, um, that kind of stuff, pay the 10 bucks, pay the five bucks. But if you just want to uh, listen and learn as I teach, that's totally cool too. I'll be here just about every day. I'll have to take a break at some point. Anyway, that's it for the stream today. Thanks guys for showing up and I will see you tomorrow.